So hello everyone, uh, good morning from Hong Kong and uh, uh, welcome Professor Francesca Rossi from uh, IBM and also uh, Professor Kelly Tsai, who is the Associate Director of Care. I am Pascal Fong, the Director of Care. So today we are very honored to have Professor Francesca Rossi from, uh, who is the IBM uh, Fellow and also IBM AI Ethics Global Leader. Um, she has been a professor of computer science at the University of Padova for 20 years before joining IBM five years ago. She's a leader in AI. She's a fellow of both the Worldwide Association of AI and of the European one. She has been president of ICHCAI and uh, an executive counselor of Triple AI and the editor in chief of the Journal of AI Research. Uh, she's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Future of Life Institute and a deputy director of the um, Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence in Cambridge, UK. She is in the executive committee of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethical Considerations on the Development of Autonomous Intelligence Systems, and she is a member of the board of directors of the Partnership on AI. She's a member also of the European Commission High Level Expert Group uh, on AI and the General Chair of the Triple AI 2020 Conference. And she co-leads the internal IBM AI Ethics Board. Uh, so today the webinar will be co-hosted by me and Professor Kaidi Tsai, who is also the Dean of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, I will start uh, by just asking one question. Uh, so, Professor Francesca Rossi, um, you know, I think everybody uh, on everybody's mind these days is this very recent news of IBM announcing that they will stop uh, providing, not just providing uh, facial recognition technology, but it seems their news that they're going to stop the, uh, you will stop the R&D on this technology. So, we're all kind of shocked. Uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, do we need to, you know, AI, do we need to worry about our research direction? What about all the graduate students working on facial recognition technology? And how about tomorrow? What if one day, you know, somebody told us we cannot even do, um, for example, speech recognition? Um, so the implication of that, can you say something about that, how the IBM come to this decision? And, uh, and uh, um, so what, what are your take on this, please? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you, Kelly, for inviting me to this webinar. I really uh, would like to be there, but I cannot. Sorry. Um, and, uh, and yes, so this announcement was made at the beginning of this week, uh, but it doesn't contain only uh, this statement that IBM is not going to offer this general purpose face recognition, or is not going to do research, is not going to develop these uh, systems and so on. But uh, it comes together with, uh, it is included in a letter to Congress, and, uh, and that shows that this is really IBM asking Congress to really start a very comprehensive uh, initiative to understand how face recognition can be used in the best and most beneficial way. So, of course, we, uh, you know, our CEO, you know, stated very clearly what we are going to do from now on, but also the fact that we don't uh, uh, apply any, we don't want any technology to be applied uh, for racial profiling, for the violation of human rights, for mass surveillance, uh, for the violation of freedom of people and so on. But uh, also we say sh that AI should always be tested uh, for bias, for example. And these tests should be audited and should be uh, reported. Um, we also say that AI can be useful for additional transparency. You know, so it's not just you know it's, there are uh, of course uh, beneficial uses of AI, but uh, and we also know that uh, there, there, there there is the need for uh, training and the education of everybody to give really everybody, no matter the gender, the race, uh, uh, op uh, economic opportunities. So in this whole uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, framework, uh, there is really the ask to Congress to really start an initiative to understand 
what, what kind of face recognition and if face recognition and how it can be applied into the law, possibly into law enforcement settings. If it makes sense to apply there or not, and in what way, with what guard, guardrails, uh, transparency, accountability, and so on. So in fact, in the letter, uh, if you read it, there is also so an initiative, uh, ask for an initiative on responsible technological policies and also police reform and account more accountability for police. But we were very happy that after this letter was published, which was on uh, June 8th, then two days later, Amazon also <clears throat> decided to follow with the, not exactly the same, but a similar uh, trend and also uh, today also Microsoft. <clears throat> so I actually have this question, you know, as a, as a researcher in AI in Hong Kong, you know, we're basically uh, collaborating with uh, the world and as well as with China, of course. So I have this question, maybe it's naive, right? So. Um, so suppose the U.S. companies decide to do what you're doing, and suppose even the European companies decide to stop providing facial recognition technologies. Um, wouldn't it be easier like, for people to basically procure technology from countries where they're not stopping doing this? And what is the implication of that? You, know, um, you cannot tell uh, everybody else not to do it, right? So that applies not just to facial recognition, but other technologies. Um, so yeah, what are, of what course. So that's that's why you know we uh, you know IBM did not just say, oh, we are not going to do it. Period. He said here we need Congress in the U.S., but similar in other places. We need the U.S. Congress to really think about what's the beneficial use of this technology how it should be used, what are the guardrails, what, how AI can be used for uh, improving the situation uh, how, uh, and for uh, um, improving accountability and transparency rather than using it for uh, racial profiling or other uh, um, initiatives that uh, we don't agree on. So, so that's, I think, uh, uh, the purpose of really asking for a very wide initiative uh, to think about the beneficial use of this technology uh, and how it should be applied. And hopefully that will avoid that, you know, race to find the next uh, uh, company that can provide that technology, that, you know, uh, if, 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 if IBM or others are not going to uh, provide it. Yeah, so Kelly and I, we are both um, uh, in the working group on uh, uh, ethical beneficial AI of the partnership on AI. And I remember, um, you know, I knew you, I knew you a long time ago, you're a leader in the field, but I think the first time we really connected and uh, conversed a lot was perhaps when we met at the, all, the very first All Partners meeting of the partnership on AI in Berlin, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you were one of the uh, founding board members. So uh, I think maybe you can talk about, uh, so what is partnership on AI? And Kelly, you have questions regarding that? Sure, actually, uh, first, Professor Rossi, it's an absolute honor to meet someone uh, with your depth of expertise in your field. We're just truly delighted to have you with us. And I think your discussion of IBM taking leadership in insisting on uh, responsible and ethical use of facial recognition technology really gets into the broader issue of the role of tech companies in working together. And, uh, and for those of in our audience who aren't necessarily familiar with the background for PAI, the Partnership on AI, I thought it might be helpful um, mm -hmm. since you and IBM as a founding member um, played such a key role in its establishment to, to just to inform us at a general level what motivated the founding of the Partnership on AI, what are, are its objectives, and the particular role, role of IBM and, and other companies in that process. So this initiative has been uh, um, uh, started, I mean the idea of the initiative started in 2016 in the summer of 2016, uh, in that period, there were uh, already several events around AI ethics and beneficial AI and researchers of AI were meeting at this event. And at some point it became clear 
to all of us that uh, um, there were issues and uh, best practices that had to be defined about how to develop and deliver AI in an beneficial way that uh, it would have been impossible to define by each single company by itself. And so it would have been much better to do it in a, in a um, um, in a collaborative environment where, uh, in an open way, companies can share best practices, learn from each other, uh, and not just companies, you know, but also all the other stakeholders. So, um, uh, at the beginning, of course, the founding partners were six companies. Uh, it was Amazon, Apple, Facebook, uh, Google, DeepMind, uh, IBM, and Microsoft. But uh, um, very soon we included uh, many other partners. And now there are uh, about 100 partners, of which only 20 are companies. And everybody else is, again, representing all the other stakeholders, like civil society organizations, um, uh, NGOs, UN agencies, universities, research centers. So all together, we are trying to tackle in the various projects, uh, tackle one specific issue. And uh, to me, the, the main advantage of the partnership on AI is, uh, is I mean, several. First of all, that companies that uh, are usually competing and are still competing on the marketplace, uh, they agree to be in the same room and to uh, collaboratively discuss about these best, best practices about uh, 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 AI development uh, and deployment. Second, that these companies are in the same room, not just by themselves, but also with these other organizations. Like, for example, I can think of uh, in the US, uh, I think of the ACLU, which is typically an organization that goes against companies, doesn't sit in the same room as a company, or usually it sues the company. No? So this is very important to be in a collaborative environment and things can be obtained that otherwise would not be uh, achieved in the normal, you know, a little bit adversarial environment that these uh, kind of different stakeholders are. Um, and also, you know, it, it's, uh, there are many projects that uh, since then, you know, for officially the, then uh, it was started in the spring of 2017. Um, and uh, again, then we expanded, you know, mostly in the US, but also Europe and some also in, uh, in Asia. Uh, but we, ta we really considered many different issues from explainability. Uh, to the issue of transparency, to the issue of the use of AI in the judicial system, uh, even to the publication policies for AI, even face recognition with a very, I think, a very successful report and also visual um, uh, kind of uh, um, story that uh, tries to explain and educate, because this is one of the goals, to educate people that are not that familiar with the technology, but maybe will make decisions about the technology, like educate what really face recognition is, if it's different from face detection, from face authentication, you know, and so those that need to regulate AI yeah, needs to understand, of course, they cannot be experts, but they need to understand the main ideas in order to really understand what is risky, what is not risky, and so on. Um, so sharing best practices, defining issue, and identifying uh, technical and also non-technical solutions, and educating the public, the media, and the policy makers. Um, so there are also, of course, uh, uh, projects, I think, on uh, human AI collaboration, on the impact of AI on jobs, um, on uh, bias, and, and the use of demographic data. So, so very, very diverse. And for each project, the, a subset of the 100 partners decide to get together and the office of the partnership on AI tries to keep a balance between the for-profit and non-for-profit stakeholders that are in the project. So overall, I think it's a very um, successful uh, uh, experiment that I think it's unique in its way of being really very multi-stakeholder. That's, um, it's, it's actually uh, provides uh, an incredible case study because what you see are tech companies on their own getting together and then creating a much broader and uh, pluralistic 
governance framework. And usually you kind of expect, you know, state agencies or governments to take the lead in regulation. So in this process, I'd just be interested in hearing how, um, how seamless has it been to reach consensus? I mean, if you look on the website of PAI, the, the principles, the objectives, they all sound, you know, um, they all sound worthy, but I, I'm just wondering to what extent has there been internal debate between different types of stakeholders, whether private or pri uh, public, and also um, within particular groups of stakeholders. I mean, the six original companies, they're in some ways competitors in the commercial world, right? So it's really quite remarkable that they would come together and then start sharing information. So if you could just uh, reflect a little bit about the dynamics that you've observed, whether, you know, competition versus collaboration in PAI, that, that could be quite interesting for us. So when the partnership on AI was uh, founded, uh, we wanted to, the first thing that we wanted to do is to put together a list of uh, tenets, we call it a list of principles that all the partners need to at least aspire to, okay, and follow uh, uh, most possibly. And uh, so that was a very, you know, uh, I mean, of course, the tenets are very high level. So you could say, yeah, it's easy if it's high level. But, uh, you know, we were really, uh, there was really a consensus um, in uh, uh, putting together a list of, I think there are eight or ten, I don't remember, but eight of the tenets uh, that were uh, really for all these companies that decided to start this initiative were the main uh, pillars that we wanted to base this initiative on. Um, then, you know, then uh, of course, uh, uh, these uh, people that agreed on these tenets were uh, researchers. No, so the initiative came from the passion of researchers. Then each of us went back home to our own company to and to talk with lawyers, to talk with <laughs> communication people, and then, and then, uh, of course, no. But no, but nobody ever said that the tenets were not. Uh, you know, nobody ever said no. We don't want that, and so on. So we, it really was amazing when we started, and even in these projects. Uh, uh, I think that uh, really it's a different attitude. People get to the project with a different attitude. Again, uh, as an example, you know, ACLU versus some of the companies uh, outside the partnership on AI, there are even some, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, aggressive situations there. But when they come to the project of the partnership on AI, they are in a collaborative mode. And uh, also because these projects, again, those that are about education, or for example, uh, the face recognition, but also the use of AI in the judicial system. Uh, we, the report, uh, also that report, I think it was very, very successful and very well received, but it doesn't say you should do this, you shouldn't do this. It says, look, if you want to use AI in the judicial system, first of all, you need to consider these 10, I think it's a list of 10 different requirements that are needed. Some are technical, some are not technical, some have to do with training the judges. Some are, so that are needed, that, that cannot be forgotten, any of them, before you really get to the place where you can start thinking about putting AI in the judicial system. So those kind of things, I think um, uh, they are, suitable for a very collaborative environment because they are not policies. We not say, oh, we like this policy, we don't like that policy. It's not a, a place for uh, recommending policies or for doing lobbying for one regulation or another one. It's a place really to share experiences, learn from experiences, and then uh, make it, for example, one other paper that was published, this was not a report, it was actually an actual paper at the conference. It's a paper on use cases of explainability in deployed applications. That's its a collection of use cases from different companies, IBM as well, uh, that, de that uh, uh, describe how, how difficult it was to put explainability into the development process and then in deploying it to clients and what lessons are learned. So that's, that's the kind of thing that comes out. And actually that that deliverable is the only deliverable that has names of people because it was published in a conference, in a Fat Star uh, conference. But usually, the deliverables of the partnership on AI are deliverables signed by the partnership on AI, not by 
the names of people that participated in the in the project and that's also to me another really strength of the partnership on ai so it's not people it's not companies or other organizations but it's the whole ecosystem that says this is what uh, we think about this topic i think there's one interesting fact about partnership on ai which is that uh, baidu is actually a partner and I remember the former president of Baidu, Zhang Yaqing, was uh, in one of the All Partners meeting. And this is actually quite significant. It's little known, but it is quite significant. Yeah. Um, and it, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, as you know, Pascal, we have an All Partners meeting every fall. Uh, last one was in London, uh, another one in San Francisco, and then the first one, as you say, in Berlin. But this year, unfortunately, oh. we had to decide to transform it into a virtual one, uh, which, of course, it achieves some sub some objectives, but not all of them. As you know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, things that are virtual, they miss this uh, uh, informal connection and social aspect that uh, sometimes is very important, especially yes. to create a collaborative environment yeah yeah, yeah. I, I love the um, idea that PAI came together sending kind of researchers as ambassadors to bridge <laughs> to kind yeah. of set the tone no, not, really, not really because the, nope. the it was an idea of the researchers so the companies didn't know anything so then we said okay we are going to do it now we go back home yeah. and let's convince all our companies. So that's what we did. No, that's so the company didn't know that we wanted to do that thing. But it was great that they, all the companies supported the initiative. Yeah, no, that's well, absolutely brilliant and really encouraging to those of us in higher education, in research, that we can actually make a difference in that way in, and contribute to setting the agenda for businesses mm -hmm. and governments and so on and so forth. So that's... Um, that's a very encouraging uh, note to hear. Yeah. So, um, Francesca, I, I remember, um, so I was on one of the uh, expert panels for the European Commission on this high level uh, mm -hmm. commission on AI strategy. I was just there once, um, but you co-led that effort. I, I wonder if you can comment on that because my experience is that uh, the, European, uh, the European Union is, uh, has taken uh, much more proactive um, uh, um, uh, action in terms of AI governance than any other government. So, um, and why is that? And, you know, we, I'm sure Kelly has other questions about that. Perhaps you can... Yeah, so this uh, high-level expert group on AI that the European Commission uh, put together two years ago um, is a group of 52 people. Okay. Uh, I think the uh, real AI experts are less than 10. Everybody else, again, is a very multi-stakeholder group. There are lawyers, uh, there are philosophers, uh, sociologists, uh, psychologists, there are um, business people, there are uh, uh, consumer rights uh, uh, associate, representative for consumer rights associations. So it's really very, very multi-stakeholder. And also another feature of this group that although it was put together by the European Commission as a kind of a, uh, an advisory group, it is, it, was, it is still completely independent. So the European Commission doesn't tell us what to say, what to write, what to deliver, and so on. But the European Commission asked the group to deliver two things. And that's what we did, and we are also revising it now. One was the ethics guidelines for AI in Europe. And that was something that we delivered in the spring of last year. We called it the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. That's the name that we gave uh, to mean the AI that respects uh, uh, seven uh, requirements that are in this deliverable that we described and also uh, that deliverable it was very influential for the European Commission because it also contains a sort of self-assessment list a list of questions that every company producing AI every development team should ask itself uh, to make sure that they really deliver the trustworthy AI according to the seven uh, requirements uh, and they can, are complying in some sense with these seven requirements. Uh, and that has been very influential because in the, even in the recent white paper uh, that the European Commission published where they 
they, they, they describe their ideas for future AI regulations, that, that is often mentioned as one uh, possible tool uh, to support AI regulation. And then the second deliverable was the recommendations for policies and investments in AI in Europe. And uh, we also published that in, uh, in the summer of 2019, but now we are publishing First, a revised version of this assessment list that I mentioned, and also three sectorial versions of these recommendations. One for manufacturing, one for healthcare, and one for public sector. And so, because those recommendations were very general overall, you know, uh, not really specialized on sectors, and now we're going to publish that. But I think, again, that one was, a, was, I say was because at the end of the month, at the end of July, our term will be finished. So the work of that high level expert group on AI will be finished. Uh, so the work has been very interesting uh, and very, uh, I think, successful in terms of impact. Uh, but also, again, uh, to work in such a multi-stakeholder environment with people that are really background was really very, very uh, challenging at the beginning, um, but also very uh, fruitful for having ideas that otherwise e e AI experts alone would never have thought about. Uh, so for example, the first thing that we did, and we published another document that was not required by the European Commission, was to um, publish a document defining AI, our AI, because the first meeting of these 52 people, we realized that in the room there were 52 definitions of AI. So the first, some people thought that AI was just software. Uh, some people thought that AI was just robots. Others thought that AI was just autonomous. So completely, you know, all over the place. So we said, okay, the few, first few months, let's sit, let's publish a, a very simple but shared uh, definition of AI. That is, uh, that is, I actually have one, uh, you know, question. It's just out of curiosity, because I was at those, at one of those meetings. Actually, I went maybe twice. I just wonder, you, so you published those guidelines for the um, European Commission, and um, we've also seen the um, guidelines and strategy, AI strategy published by the governments of France, of Germany, of various European governments, right? So how do you work so how do you implement these guidelines in each particular European countries? Are they, how, are, well, I hope they're consistent, right? And they don't conflict each other. So how, how do you work with each of the governments? Or how well, are, do they plan to do? I think the European Commission has an initiative where uh, all the member states come together uh, and, they, uh, and they educate the member states uh, uh, about the European level uh, strategy. And, uh, and then the states go home and they have to uh, be consistent with that European level strategy. Of course, there can be different uh, specificities in the different states, but they have to be consistent. And so these deliverables of the high level expert group have informed and helped build the European level strategy. And then, of course, they can be, uh, you know, uh, 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 specified in different ways in the different countries, but the, all in a consistent way. Yeah. <clears throat> Professor Rossi, I have a follow-up question about that. Um, given that the largest tech companies are all multinationals and they operate in, you know, well over 100, 150 countries in the world, how do they negotiate the different national level regulatory environments? So the, the European Commission may be converging towards some set of norms, but that's only you know, it's like a dozen countries or so, right? Or 52, or <laughs> 52 individuals. <laughs> but how about the rest of the world? I mean, certainly when IBM is operating in France versus the US versus China or Singapore, right? Those are very different regulatory contexts. And it, I think it might be interesting for our audience to hear. Yeah, of course, the IBM yeah, of course, even before AI, yeah, you know, different countries have different legal systems and different laws about the technology. Um, so, so it's not just an issue with AI, yeah, of course, it's in general, you know, le le the legal system and the laws are different in different countries. Uh, but there are some principles that at IBM we decided to uh, state and to follow. Uh, 
um, for example, uh, one example is the, um, you know, like the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. That's a European thing, you know. It's very strict, uh, gives some, uh, gives certain rights to the to people the, the, for their uh, uh, the data that they provide um, to an AI system. Uh, so we decided to follow some of the part of the GDPR even in other parts of the world. So we have our own principles that are uh, uh, centralized and we also uh, apply them in a very coordinated way. So for example, again, uh, as uh, uh, Pascal mentioned, you know, we have internally this AI ethics board internal to IBM and the AI ethics board has uh, uh, representatives from uh, very high executives that can make decisions for all the business units and also for research, for communication, for uh, for policies, uh, government relation, and so on, um, for data privacy, and so on. So, and then these people uh, decide, for example, for, I mean, first of all, they give advice and they talk to each other. So it's a way to uh, coordinate and be aware of what happens in the different units. But also, they, we, the board gives advice to the business units about what are the principles that they should follow, whether they are in the US or in Europe or in Asia or in India or in Brazil or whatever. So whether these principles are about uh, uh, data privacy or are about uh, bias uh, testing and mitigation or other things, they, they are the same in every, uh, in, in every region of the world. So uh, um, I've, especially during the la latest months, uh, the, I think in the last uh, five months at least, um, we, uh, the ethics board has been uh, uh, evaluating many different perspective offerings from the various business units related to the COVID situation, where there is something for cotton tracing or something for return to work uh, of, other, um, of other companies and so on. So, and, and with a lot of uh, uh, discussions about the possible ethical issues, for example, related to privacy, right? So, and, and all of them, I remember some came in from, again, Brazil, from India, from Pakistan, from uh, US, of course, from Europe. Uh, uh, and we all vet them with the same criteria. You know, we give them the same template. You say, you should tell us these, these things about your uh, offering that you want to deliver. Uh, the same template for everybody, and then we vet them using the same criteria. But what we what we evaluate are three things. One is the properties of the technology. If the technology is fair, explainable, transparent, and so on. Second, the uses, the application domain, and the application use that is going to be done with that technology. And third one, the client itself. Who is going to get this technology and how is going to use it and what's the history of that client in respecting our principles or not? And then all these three things need to be like uh, you know, a positive evaluation in order for the technology to be, uh, in order for saying to the business units, yes, go ahead and do that deal. Yeah, no, it's, it's really impressive that IBM has an AI ethics board and actually you know, directly advises business units about the principles. I'm wondering though, from, um, are the business units actually held accountable to fulfilling certain KPIs when it comes to ethical AI? Or do they just sort of, you know, sit through the usual ethics conversation, like in the early days of sexual harassment training, like everyone had to just sit through it and, and then just, they went back to their, <laughs> their usual work. No, no, of course, of course, uh, it was important to have as members of the board, uh, these uh, people in charge of these business units, at the top of the business units, because those people need to give the right incentives to the various teams to actually, for example, you know, of course, if you do bias testing versus not doing it, you will spend more time uh, in, the, in developing that system, right? Because maybe you do bias testing, maybe there is no bias, okay, but you spent a little bit more of time, but maybe there is bias, then you need to spend more time to mitigate that bias and so on. So, of course, it, it is an additional effort 
Um, uh, but it's important that the incentives come from the top. That uh, you know that it's really that the the top executive of that business unit must be convinced that those additional steps are needed. And those are not additional steps where you sit through uh, some educational thing, but actually you need to test for bias and you need to report on that test. Uh, so, so that was very important. In fact, we went through a path. Uh, we didn't uh, really uh, um, create the IITs board as it is now. You know, the IITs board uh, of IBM has been around for more than two years, but at the beginning, uh, was a little bit different uh, with less decision power. So over time, we understood that we needed to have the people in charge of making decisions in the various business units. And so that we mo gradually modified to have that uh, this decision power within the company. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm going to hand the floor over to Pascal because I think um, we would love to hear a bit more about the technical aspects of your research as well. Yeah, so before I ask my question on your research, I just want to um, tell our participants that after the next uh, part of the webinar, there will be a chance for the participants to ask questions to uh, Professor Rossi. You can uh, ha ask questions in the chat box and uh, we will take your questions. All right. So, uh, so um, going to the next part, you know, um, Francesca, you talked about AI governance and uh, ethics principles and so on. Um, so, in your own research work on AI decision making process, um, have you thought about um, so how to incorporate these? Uh, is it possible even to incorporate um, these kind of principles to the level of AI system making? Or um, what is your um, you know, can you tell us more about your research? Yeah, in the, if you have in the, slides, please uh, share with us. Yeah, yeah, I will share my slides. But uh, uh, I have to say that in the recent years, uh, you know, so I, I, um, I had projects that explicitly wanted to embed ethical principles in AI decision making. Um, and uh, we work, for example, in collaboration with MIT, in collaboration with RPI, so with various uh, um, uh, academic institutions to really, and also not just computer scientists or AI people, but also uh, psychology people uh, and philosophers as well, to understand how to take some AI principles and make sure that AI is making decisions according to that AI principle. What does it take to model that principle and to make it you know, available for an AI system? Uh, then we expanded this idea and we said, okay, but maybe we need to uh, allow AI to make uh, uh, decisions by, um, because in some of these projects we were learning the ethical principles from data, some of the projects we were writing down explicitly the ethical principles, putting them uh, and then putting rules in the AI system. So we said, okay, but let's try to combine these two things. And more generally, you know, then we said, okay, how do we combine this machine learning, machine reasoning in the best way? So the idea was in this last project that I had to get inspiration from uh, the cognitive theories of human decision making. So how do we learn from, because we also learn from data, we also learn from rules and we combine them in some way. So now uh, let me share my screen uh, here. Okay, let me see if I can share it. Yes. Do you see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so, so that's the project that we call the Thinking Fast and Slow in AI because the Thinking Fast and Slow is the, the theory from uh, Daniel Cunningham. Uh, you see there are many people, 10 people, some in IBM and some even outside IBM that work in this project and that's our inspiration. So the theory of uh, uh, Daniel Cunningham, which is a theory of how we make decisions, combining different capabilities and uh, to make uh, or to put order in all our capabilities, uh, Cunningham said, okay, uh, let's, summar, let's uh, 
let's say that this big set of capabilities that we have, we can put them in two main categories and he calls them the system one and system two. So system one usually is when we react to something in a kind of unconscious way, automatic, very fast, and we take everyday decision and 95% of the time that's how we make decisions. But then there is also the system two, which is most slow, uh, very conscious and deliberate thinking and the decisions uh, and uh, uh, we don't use it very often but when we use it we really uh, are very careful and usually we get to the solution of a problem with a much uh, higher accuracy so here are some examples system one can uh, help us do the things that are cognitively simple like uh, uh, to read in our native language uh, to say whether a number is odd and even things like that but system two instead is for more complex tasks for more complex scenarios so the idea was say well after all the system one which is the unconscious thing is not uh, that different the features of system one is not that different from a kind of data-driven machine learning approach and system two is not that different from a symbolic logic uh, uh, reasoning uh, ai approach so uh, for example, we said at the beginning, several months ago, we say, ah, okay, so then maybe we can uh, build an architecture where in AI where we can also have these two kinds of capabilities, one more data-driven and one more uh, uh, rule-based, uh, that communicate with each other. And when this fast, biased, incorrect procedure of system one uh, understand that it's too complex for, uh, that for the task is too complex, for example, because it returns the solution with a very low confidence, then system two can take over and can solve correctly a task. Um, and then this solution can serve as an additional training data for the system one so that later on can be better at solving the task. But of course, this feature is very simplified and is not that simple because uh, yes, it's true that system one is similar to machine learning, but uh, system one, our system one, can also handle very well causality and common sense, which is something not that, uh, uh, not that uh, um, into the machine learning approach. Uh, uh, so also machines and human beings have very different capabilities and limitations so like memory, computational power, attention and so on. So it's, it's not that simple as it looked at the beginning. And also uh, uh, in a machine, who decides whether it's system one or system two that needs to take up some task and so on. So we went into a very long exploratory phase that we still are on, where we mostly ask questions rather than giving solutions, where we mainly follow several lines of words. One is to really understand what should be the functionalities of the machine system one and the machine system two. What, uh, in what way is, should it be different from the human one and what, uh, what functionality should that? Second, how these uh, capabilities should interact with each other. What's the governance model that you want on top of them? Are they all distributed and in parallel and then they talk to each other and they decide in a distributed way who is going to tackle us on a problem? Or is there an additional agent, a this kind of a dispatcher that says this is the task I understand how difficult it is and I give it to this agent or to this other one, system one or system two. So also, how do we divide the labor between these different agents? What are the factors to use to uh, ma make sure that we give the, the, each task to the agent that can solve it uh, as best? And also, how do we model this knowledge that these agents by solving tasks accumulate and share with each other uh, in, in a way, because maybe the system one deals with raw data, uh, the system two deals with more high level symbols and concepts, so how do they communicate with each other in terms of the no, declarative and procedural knowledge. And, and last one, we really wanted to have a very general architecture that could support all these experimental, uh, uh, all these experiments about the functionalities, about the governance model, about the sharing of knowledge and so on. And so we are building a general architecture where that can support all these concepts that are needed, like perception, memory, attention, learning, reasoning, all these things that you see here. 
So the main dimensions that we have in mind where we want to see some, uh, some uh, advancement uh, is first of all, multi-agent. Multi-agent means within the same uh, machine that maybe has several agents, how is knowledge shared? And how is knowledge shared between several machines? Each one may be a multi-agent system, but how do they share knowledge? Do they share knowledge through their system one or through their system two, or you know, in which way? Second one, uh, we want to uh, explore the dynamic dimension. How do these uh, system one and system two capabilities and interactions change over time? We know that human beings have some tasks that at the beginning we tackle with our system two, but after a while we pass them to system one, like uh, for example, uh, learning how to drive a bicycle. At the beginning we have to be very careful, all our attention is there. We put together a procedure, first I do this, first I do that. Then later on, after a while, it's just system one. We are not even conscious that, uh, of what we are doing. And third one, the abstraction levels. So, Machine learning collects data and, uh, and interprets this data in some way. But the system two, this is the system one, but the system two needs to handle general concepts uh, to build procedures, uh, solution procedures that deal with general concepts. So how is this uh, information here being uh, analyzed to uh, uh, focus only on these general concepts that are abstract and then brought to the other, uh, to the other level. Uh, in, uh, what Benjo would say, this is the conscious level. So how do I bring conscious uh, uh, reasoning into this uh, typical machine learning approach? And last one, as you said, Pascal, is the ethical dimension. So in some sense, our system one, the unconscious one, is uh, uh, more, seem, is, um, is the way we function, which uh, is more similar to the, what be, some people would call the deontological approach to ethics theories, no? Is we have some very simple rules and we follow those rules. While our system two is the one that is able to uh, evaluate the consequences of our actions in order to understand which one is good and which one is bad. So that's more like a system two kind of thing. So can we bring this with the suitable adaption into the uh, 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 system one and system two into the machine. So what does it mean for a machine to, to be, uh, be able to combine the ontological approaches and consequentialist approaches? Because even in human beings, we are not, uh, not a, I mean, we are not completely the ontologists and we are not completely consequentialist. We switch depending on the context, right? And so how do we, um, build a machine that knows how to do that. <clears throat> so those are the main uh, things. And uh, I mean, I, I don't have anything technical, but we have uh, more technical things, but mostly really is, is uh, the exploratory. And uh, of course, there are many people that uh, are inspired by this theory uh, in order to in inject uh, uh, more high level and conscious and symbolic capabilities into machine learning. Um, and and uh, I personally think that that's the way to go to significantly advance uh, the state of the art in terms of robustness or on uh, ability to generalize uh, and many other things where still uh, we are a bit lacking in AI. So I'll stop here and then if people have any question, you know, you well. Yeah, we're collecting questions from the audience now. People should still uh, feel free to type into the um, chat. Is it the chat or the Q&A, Pascal? The Q&A? Right. Q&A, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I love your um, framing it in terms of Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. It's, um, it applies to basically everything we do <laughs> in life throughout the day. And I was curious in particular about the S2 being the ethical engine. Um, that makes it sound very technical, but in actuality, a lot of time when system two takes over uh, because we're, as humans, it's an emotional reaction. And so to what extent can the AI or should the AI incorporate that emotive component? Sometimes um, S2 takes over because of love, fear, 
guilt, vengeance, right? So how, how do you, how is that handled when system two is emotional rather than so-called rational? Well, uh, okay, so in my view, again, uh, um, system two is more like uh, the part of our brain that uh, can uh, um, think about the consequences of our actions. So again, more like a consequentialist approach to ethics. While system one, I would say, is the one that is in like reacting uh, in a very almost unconscious automatic way uh, based on uh, some simple rules that are uh, in our mind. Um, but uh, we, we had a project that really tried to understand how machines can connect these two ways of doing things and of judging whether an action is good or bad. Uh, so what we did in that project, which again, this is an expansion of, of that of that work. What we did in that project with MIT was to um, try to understand how humans make that switch between following just our immediate reaction or thinking through the consequences. So we gave, we used mechanical talk, we gave to many people a lot of questions about three different scenarios where we asked a, a moral, to make a moral judgment, a moral judgment question. And it was a very simple scenario. Uh, the scenario was of being somewhere where there is a line and there was an airport, a bathroom, and a deli. Okay? Uh, well, you are in a line and then somebody comes and would like to skip the line. And it gives you a reason for skipping the line. Uh, and then the question is, uh, do you think that is acceptable that he skips the line? Right? And, uh, and then we try to analyze when people base that moral judgment only on uh, uh, evaluating the scenario and the reason for skipping the line, or when they think about uh, the consequences of that person skipping the line onto, for example, the other people in line. So, uh, so we, we try to really understand when people, which conditions make people behave in a consequentialist way and which conditions may people behave in a uh, deontological way when do we switch and then we try to model that into a machine so how do we build a machine that can uh, understand that switching uh, and that was an, an initial idea that we said okay so in some sense uh, this uh, uh, we uh, this uh, 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 making a moral judgment without uh, considering the consequences is like a system one kind of behavior. While based on very simple rules, reaction, unconscious, automatic, fast, and so on. But the other uh, approach where the, where the machine goes through the consequences and then depending on the consequences, decide whether it's acceptable or not that uh, uh, breaking the rules uh, in that particular case, you know, speak, skipping the line, then that would be more like a consequentialist approach. So, um, so yes, I mean, uh, uh, it's not that we built machines with emotions, now that's not the case, but we wanted to build a machine that could mimic uh, in, that in that sense, uh, the, what, how people switch between the two. Now, having said that, I'm not saying that the ultimate goal is to build machines that mimic human beings the behavior of human beings. But it's important that machines understand how we make decisions. Because if we want machines to work together with us, they need to be aware of how we make decisions. Uh, even if then machines will make it in a, in a possibly different way because of different capabilities, limitations, and it wouldn't make sense. I mean, we don't want, I mean, the goal of the project is not to replicate a human being, but to, to build something that can um, complement human beings, you know, and augment the capabilities of a human being. Yeah, so um, that leads to a question that I have. So uh, actually, it's, um, it's um, Kelly sort of um, touched upon that. So we often say humans, you know, we make mistakes when we make rash decisions um, based on probably uh, fast thinking or emotions and so on. And there's a hope that the machines won't make the same kind of mistake, right? Now, so there's, a, there's an argument 
for against the machines mimicking humans. There's actually a very good argument against this, which is that um, we want machines to do things, um, the good things that humans do and not make the mistakes that we do. And uh, for certain things, it's easy to control. For example, um, you know, if you want machines not to misspeak, you obviously you can uh, program something. So, but you know, what you're talking about is really, uh, because sometimes we do need the machines to make quick decisions, right? So what you're talking about is very interesting because, because humans are imperfect, but I tend to think that we're imperfect for very good reason, right? Mm -hmm. Um, our errors are the other sides of the same coin where we are also uh, intelligent. So the human errors come from our intelligence. The mechanism of intelligence leads to these errors at the same time. But for machines, you know, machine intelligence and machine errors today, the errors today are simply bugs, right? But if the machines become as intelligent as humans, the way you describe it, as, at least, then we will also allow machines to make same kind of rash decisions or how, what do you think we should do? Or what are we gonna do? Well, of course, I mean, first of all, the, um, uh, well, let's say that uh, uh, I agree with you with all these uh, pros and cons, you know, uh, and uh, I agree that we cannot just build machines that are perfectly rational, you know, because, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know now because I don't know how uh, the technology will evolve or the science will evolve. But uh, I think that by making them completely rational and uh, uh, would make them less uh, flexible and less able to deal with uh, uh, adapting uh, to new situations uh, and also less able to uh, work with human beings uh, from the social point of view, the, from the social interaction point of view. Uh, there are some scenarios, of course, where you would like to be supported by a completely rational machine. Like, for example, in, uh, I can think of an, uh, in a sur during a surgery, you know, you want, uh, uh, you would like somebody or a machine or whatever to tell you exactly what needs to be done. What's the best uh, solution in that particular problem uh, that may be a life or death uh, situation? Um, and maybe a human being can can go into a panic mode or whatever. So, so in that case, it could be useful to support the human being with a completely rational agent, let's say. But in many other cases, you want machines to also be able to uh, uh, to be able to use uh, capabilities that, and we have seen also now we've seen with machine learning, machine learning compared to. Uh, um, um, rule-based AI or logic-based AI, machine learning makes mistakes. Rule-based AI does nothing, but machine learning is able to solve many more problems in a much, with much higher quality that could not be solved with uh, logic-based and uh, reasoning uh, kind of AI. So, um, however, it's true, as you know, that uh, yes, machine learning showed the power of learning from data rather than coding down some rules but uh, is also showing uh, some limitations at this point because we have seen like uh, even with uh, GTP3, you know, a huge amount of resources, huge amount of uh, uh, computational resources uh, to solve a problem and the huge amounts of data, you see that still there are limitations. So there must be another way where knowledge should be inserted into these systems um, to take the best of this uh, uh, rule-based AI and symbolic-based AI to improve uh, the capabilities of machine learning. So uh, I, would not, uh, I, would not, I would not say that AI would be advanced by uh, removing these uh, possibly uh, biased and possibly uh, uh, pa capabilities that maybe make mistakes because that also gives the power to be flexible and to be um, uh, and also to be, you know, uh, relating with human beings, which I think that's, that should be the ultimate goal, you know, to be uh, helping us. And uh, I don't think that human beings are going to be helped um, as much as possible if we, uh, we give a very inflexible machine. <clears throat> so, you know, it's almost coming to a full circle to our very first question, which is that in the case of 
facial recognition and IBM's decision. Um, so we continue to use machine learning to do facial recognition, but well, there are different approaches, right? We could say that let's de-bias the models or let's uh, uh, collect more data or so on. But IBM also decided to go at a higher human governance level saying that it should not be used this way and that way. Um, so um, you're thinking that, um, so we can work on this. We can work on um, ethical AI at different levels, at the implementation level, algorithm design level, machine learning level, but also at the policy level. That's yes, the message, yes, right? of course, of course. Yeah. So we yeah, have because, a, uh, because it's important that the technology has the right properties. So yeah. it's tested and good for bias. It's transparent. It's explained all these properties of the technology itself. But then it's important how you regulate it and how you use it. So all these aspects are part of uh, a, a responsible. Uh, uh, you know, use and development of the technology. So the message for AI graduate students is that uh, there are actually, there is actually new opportunity, right? There are new opportunities to work on de-biasing AI, to make better uh, AI algorithms and models so that it would not be biased, it would be uh, explainable and so on, right? These are actually new yeah. areas of so research. Of course, I don't have the numbers, but I think that a significant percentage of uh, even new RIPS papers are about fairness indeed, or indeed. about explainability, you know, indeed. all these things. So, so, and there are entire conferences that are devoted to fairness, indeed. explainability, transparency, indeed. and so on. Indeed. So um, we have a question from audience. Can you see that, Francesca? And now- oh, where? Where? Uh, in it's the in chat? Q and I'll read it to you. Okay. Uh, audience member asks, large black box models such as GPT-2, 3 are trained with large amount of text, images or speech from all around the internet, which can have bias by itself. And uh, these models, is, though very rarely, but still generate bias, sometimes racist and sexist output. Where is the boundary for companies to deploy these models and uh, making a profit from them? So, so again, again uh, independently of where the data comes from, which of course it has its own uh, policies and its own uh, guidelines and so on, but uh, yes, I mean, uh, you can uh, easily um, um, have, uh, you can easily find the data sets that have bias. So it's very important that you can detect the bias in these training data sets and you can mitigate it. But that's not enough because even if your training data set does not contain the kind of bias that you are interested, because there is another aspect that, of course, there are many different definitions of fairness. And so you can detect bias corresponding of, to the correct definition of fairness, right? But even when you do that, you still need to continue in the development of the system. In every phase, you can inject bias. For example, if you say, I'm going to extract entities or concepts from a piece of text, just the choice of the list of concepts that you may extract, that may be a bias decision because maybe you want to extract just two or three instead of four or whatever. So, so every step you need to uh, be careful about the possible bias that you inject. That's why, for example, at IBM, we published a small booklet for our developers, but in general, for developers in general, that uh, tells them about all these possible ways that they need to remember that of possible kinds of bias uh, that they can inject uh, during the various phases of the development. So you need to train these development teams. Uh, and of course, the more diverse they are and the better it is uh, to go well, look at from different points of view and to be aware that they can put bias themselves, even without being aware. So they really need to be uh, and when the product is ready to be deployed, first of all, the bias has to be you know, detected all, all in all the phases, not just at the end. But even at the end, you need to again test uh, how it behaves. It behaves in a biased way um, and to be able to evaluate what you have uh, put together from the bias point of view. But again, not just any bias because uh, uh, there was a tutorial a few years ago that was titled the 21 definitions of fairness or something like that so uh, so for each scenario each context you have the correct definition 
that of course cannot be decided by the company developing that technology. It has to be decided together with those that are going to be affected by those decisions. Uh, so again, in a multi-stakeholder way, and once you define the, the right uh, definition of fairness, then you say, okay, so I'm going to make sure that my uh, product is fair in that way. So I'm going to remove the bias that is correspond to that definition of fair. All right. <laughs> Um, so Kelly, do you have another question? Oh, oh no, you're, you're muted. muted. Can Sorry. You... <laughs> that has to happen at least once in every webinar, right? <laughs> I'll circling back uh, to something that you were talking about earlier, Francesca. I was just thinking about um, that awful tragedy of Uber self-driving car killing a pedestrian in Arizona because its machine learning system didn't account for for jaywalking. Um, and this is a case where I think from a corporate pers I mean, first it's absolutely tragic, but it was being, it was being rational that if the light was green, no one was supposed to be jaywalking. And so it just, it went forward. And then after that, um, I think Uber took those self-driving cars off, off the streets to, to keep um, fine tuning it. But one of the issues this raises is um, these, these machines in application can bring about all sorts of risk, right? And so from a corporate perspective, um, is there something like cyber insurance to try to mitigate the, the damage, you know, both whether it be bodily harm or financial or, I mean, like major problems could potentially ensue from relying on AI systems. And yeah. I'm curious about how IBM is thinking about that or, or other well, companies. Well, of course, uh, uh, the, the, you, it's important to put in place an AI risk uh, uh, framework within the company and then to make decisions based on the evaluation of these things. So one thing that we did, again, in collaboration with other companies, uh, this time not with the partnership on AI, but within the World Economic Forum. So what we did, we did a project called uh, the AI Board Toolkit, which was a project with various modules online that, that uh, any company board can use to really evaluate some of the modules. For example, one was called AI Risk, one was called AI Ethics, and then there were other ones about AI, understanding what AI can do for your company and so on. But there were modules that were telling these board members or executives in the company, so how you, do you, you need to evaluate the risk in developing and deploying these, these AI product, and then how you make decisions, so how you make sure that uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, an informed decision so based on the evaluation of the risk. And then this notion of risk for us is very important also from the uh, regulation point of view. So we advocate for a risk-based uh, risk regulation of AI, where uh, a formal regulation laws should be in place only for high risk uh, uh, applications. So not even high risk technology, because we believe that the high or low risk is not in the technology, but is in the application of the technology. And uh, we think that both the US and the uh, European Union are following this, uh, this uh, uh, high risk or low risk uh, uh, kind of uh, framework for uh, defining future regulation. So that, that we think is the right way to go. But definitely the risk has to be evaluated. Uh, along several dimensions. <clears throat> but I have to say that with self-driving cars, the most, uh, the most um, um, uh, the mo the impactful thing of the self-driving car is not, in my view, in the self-driving cars themselves, but in the assisted driving technology that now most of the uh, car companies are in, including in their uh, human driven cars, right? Uh, so again, again, is a way to help humans uh, do better or in a safer way what they were already doing. And all the experimentation about self-driving cars, of course, helped, uh, you know, push that, uh, that kind of the assistive uh, driving technology that I think it's very helpful. And it is really saving a lot of lives already, even if uh, the, the, there is a human driver and it's not a self-driving car. 
So that sounds like it should also be applicable to other areas, uh, such as assistive uh, diagnosis in the medical area to help humans and instead of replacing humans, right? And yeah. uh, a lot of technologies uh, we're developing in AI can ultimately basically assist human, um, human, human, humans to do the job better. Um, I see there are other questions from the audience. Um, can you see? Um, I can, I'll, I'll read out um, okay. one of them. So Professor Rossi, thank you for the illuminating talk. I have two quick questions. One, how do you see the reflexive relation between AI systems and the self going forward? We have, for instance, societies deploying mechanisms of social credit to engender not only trust in AI systems, but broader social forms of trust, which will in turn rely on AI technologies for evaluation and decision making. How do you see developments like this? And then this person has a second question. In this relationship between the self and machines, are we ourselves going to become, quote unquote, de-biased or less biased, or is it about telling good from bad forms of bias? How to decide? Yeah, so, so uh, yes. So not only, you know, by, by detecting and mitigate bias in an AI system, we make the AI less biased. So we make the AI making uh, more fair decisions and also uh, recommending uh, human beings to to make more fair decisions but uh, also the AI itself can help human beings to be less biased so it's a two-way thing once we uh, understand how to uh, eliminate bias from machines then machines can help us uh, uh, recognize and be aware of our own bias so already in uh, for example in uh, in uh, HR, for example, uh, there are systems that uh, uh, alert um, uh, managers that are that have an op open positions and they receive candidates and tries to select shortlist or whatever. They alert them uh, if they see that they are choosing, uh, you know, shortlist uh, candidates so that in a way that does not respect some uh, uh, fairness uh, criteria and so on. So it's also a way for the machine to, you know, it's a two-way street uh, that uh, um, machines can help us uh, be, you know, less biased ourselves. Uh, so, and I think this is what uh, it was referring to. Um, so we are going to become the biased by the machines, yes. Um, Yes, and, and no, the first question is about this idea of trust. That's very important in AI ethics in general. Now, how you build this system of trust between humans and machines. And this is especially important when you want these two entities to work together. If you want a doctor to, to work together with a support uh, system for its decision, he has to trust this uh, AI system. Otherwise, uh, it will not uh, uh, take on the recommendations of this AI system. So how do you build this trust? And uh, of course, it's something that you build by showing that uh, the machine behaves in a certain way over time uh, like within human beings you know like at the beginning is not uh, I don't maybe trust uh, I don't know if I can trust or not somebody but over time if I see this person behaving in a way that respects my principles then I can trust that person and the same uh, is going to be with machines the machines are going to show whether, and also not only show, but they're going to be tested and reported on whether they can be aware and follow our own principles so that we can trust and follow their recommendation. <clears throat> Yeah, just a, a small personal comment. I think humans need to keep their system too functioning too. Yesterday I was driving in a tunnel and my GPS kept telling me to make the next right turn. But if I had done that, I would have crashed into the side of the tunnel and I couldn't get it to shut up, but I didn't want to. So I just decided I'm going to stop listening to this thing and get my own way. But those points are very well taken. We, uh, there's one more question here in the room. Um, asked by Stuart Kittel Bastin. He is our Associate Dean of Research at the, in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And he said, you mentioned working with World Economic Forum. I wonder if you can say a little bit about how IBM is working with other international organizations such as the UN on shaping AI issues and policies, such as working towards the SDGs, for example. 
sustainable development. Yeah, so, but first of all, uh, uh, the several UN agencies are part of the partnership on AI. So we work together with them in that environment. But also, uh, we, the UN uh, organizes every, uh, every spring a, a summit that is called the global, um, the AI global, um, so, sorry, AI for good global summit, uh, where uh, uh, there are these two groups of people that are put together and forced to work together for three days. So these two groups of people are the AI uh, experts on one side, the companies and those, the researchers and so on, and the, 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 they're called the problem uh, solvers. And the other group is the problem owners, which are the UN agents. Okay. People represented the UN agency. So, but putting together these two uh, in, in this summit, there were several, you know, and we worked with them. I mean, I've been involved all the time. It's already four times that this summit takes place in the uh, organizing parts of this uh, summit. And uh, we really see that a lot of new know, innovative ideas come about because maybe we have the right technology, but we are not aware of the right problems to be solved to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals. For example, this year, again, also this summit is not going to be in person, of course, but it's going to be virtual and uh, in particular in September this time. This, this time I'm co-chairing the, the, the special track on uh, gender issues. Uh, where we want really to put together, you know, those that know the technology and those that know the issues about gender equality, uh, uh, how AI can help in that respect. Another thing that we do uh, together, uh, not with the UN specifically, but uh, towards the sustainable development goals of the UN, is we have an internal program that is called AI for, uh, for Social Good, where every uh, summer there is a number of interns that come, so postdocs or PhD students, they come to IBM, they are mentored for three months from IBM researchers, and they focus on a project uh, given by some, um, the, by some foundation or for some external uh, organization or UN agency that can give also the data and the problem to be solved. Uh, it can be like uh, in the US, I remember, I don't know, the opio opioid um, um, crisis or the Zika uh, pandemic or whatever. I'm sure there will be many about the COVID-19 uh, in the future. And they really work uh, uh, IBM people, uh, researchers, these interns, together with the external party, defining the problem and giving the data on solving that specific problem. And we had already many with a lot of successes also in the healthcare or many others. Uh, and that's also one way for us to educate the next generation on using what it means to use AI for social good. <clears throat> Yeah, so I would just want to make a comment that uh, we have been working to bring the UN uh, AI for Good Summit to Asia, uh, in particular to, um, to bring the summit to Hong Kong. And obviously because of the current situation, uh, we're not gonna have the first one in uh, uh, virtual. We want to have the first one in person. So hopefully we can have the summit in Asia next, um, next year, 2021. And then we can all solve the problems that um, the Asian nations here face as well. Yeah. All right. Um, so thank you so much, um, Professor Francesca Rossi, Francesca. And uh, if there's no other questions, I just uh, want to take the privilege of asking you one burning last question, okay. which is the number you listed earlier, is it a prime number or not? Which number? In your slide, the very first one, slow and fast thinking. Oh, I thought it was I a prime, but I'm I don't, not sure. I don't you remember. You list the number, number, it's a huge long number, and you ask the question, can humans figure out it's prime or not? And okay, let me prime. check. I don't remember. I mean, those slides. <laughs> okay, you let me know. <laughs> I don't know. That's why we need to use our system too to, to address <laughs> those questions. Prime, but let's, let's because because uh, we cannot do like without system one. You know? Okay, so, um, so I have 50% chance of getting it right. Anyways, okay. So this has been uh, such a wonderful um, experience uh, talking with you, Francesca. And, um, and I really look forward to um, 
seeing you in person again. Uh, maybe yeah. at the World Economic <laughs> Forum, maybe at the UN Summit, maybe at the Triple AI or one, one of the many AI conferences. Yeah. I yeah. cannot wait to see you and uh, I cannot wait for us all to work together again in person. Yeah, and definitely. Kelly and Kelly, thank you so much for your very sophisticated questions, I would say. And uh, I hope the audience uh, um, enjoyed it. I, I'm sure they have as much as we have. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, both yeah. of you and all the questions. I mean, it was very enjoyable and I hope that uh, I gave some interesting, uh, uh, you know, points for discussion or thoughts for everybody. Very much so. Uh, thank absolutely. you so much. You're, you're a real inspiration to our students and a real role yeah. model for many of us in the field. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.